Uh, I can hear on and off some of the other things, but what you like from the colleagues here. So I'm going to talk to you today about ethics and the accuracy. And I introduced the work by reference to the original article by Paul Cookson, where he suggested that so extensive is the influence of human beings on the planet now that we have effectively moved into a new geological epoch called, which he named, uh, The End of the Sea. This is in a paper that he wrote back in um, somewhere around 1997, the original paper. Since then, uh, the term has been quite widely adopted. He argued that the most likely uh, date for the um, evidence, the scientific evidence, for the onset of this new epoch was the um, invention of the condensing steam engine uh, by James Watson in 1784. We happen to rather like this, because of course it puts the beginning of the Anthropocene in Edinburgh, which is James Watt's work, and he invented this one being there. However, uh, and, the, and the reason for, for claiming that the steam engine started the new epoch is because the steam engine made possible the fossil fuel industrial revolution which began in England and spread to the Ruhr in Germany and is now worldwide. Because that engine was so much more efficient than any engine that had been previously invented in the industry and led to a vast increase in the amount of fossil fuels uh, ultimately being emitted into the atmosphere. However, since his original proposal, others have suggested that instead we should, start, we should think about 1950 and the date for the onset of the Anthropocene, this new geological impact. The reason is this is, this is uh, the beginning of a period of the last 60 years or so, which a number of scientists have dubbed the Great Acceleration. And this is an acceleration in human industrialization and domination of the planet, through consumerism, jet engines. Opportunity trainers, computers, and so on. So they argue that this is created in a sense for the planet a new age of humans, where we, more than the sun, rocks, or anything else, have become a geological force, literally a force of nature, shaping planet Earth. As Bill Stephan, one of the few people in the science of the Anthropocene, argues, in a single lifetime, humanity has become a planetary scale. Theological force. And he goes on, one creature stands out as remarkable when you survey the data of human influence. The second half of the 20th century is unique in the entire history of human existence on it. Many human activities which take off point sometime in the 20th century have accelerated sharply towards the end of the century. The last 50 years have, without doubt, seen the most rapid transformation of the human relationship with the natural world in the history of. Just some of the evidence for this includes the fact that human beings move more steadily and work on all natural processes put together now on the planet. Seventy percent of all land area on the planet is now managed actually by humans. Ninety percent of all fish on the oceans has been harvested by industrial trawlers since 1950. Land and ocean temperatures are rising because of human activities. Sea levels are rising because of human activities. Biodiversity of species is declining because of human activities. Soil is eroding and groundwater is diminishing in many parts of the world because of human activities. We effectively are now in charge of two of the most important um, chemical cycles on the planet the nitrogen cycle and the carbon cycle. We're in charge of them, but we really don't know how to manage them. And that's what this lecture is about. If we look at the Great Acceleration, then, in terms of socioeconomic trends, you can see an extraordinary rise here, yeah, which begins in 1950, or which really takes off in 1950, of population, of GDP, of urbanization, of primary energy use. You can go through this. Fertilizer consumption massively increased since 1916. The building of large dams, fresh water use, uh, and the other as you can see there. But this, these, these show clearly in the trends the extent to which the industry is a crucial epoch of data. And then you look at the Earth system effects, so the effects of this activity on the Earth system. And you see an extraordinary takeoff in CO2 from the atmosphere in 1950. Similarly, of nitrous oxide and methane, also highly significant climate change in the atmosphere. 
So it's very ozone really takes off in about 1970, uh, and we hope will soon begin to decline as the uh, ozone depleting chemicals are phased out down the road. So marine fish capture also uh, extraordinarily high increase since uh, 1950. So essentially then, when you look at the Earth system trends, what you see is that the Anthropocene, as scientists are saying, represents a new spatial order of human activity, which influences now, not only particular regions of the planet, but through the biogeochemical processes of the planet, the whole of what is called by many scientists now, the Earth system. If we look at the mechanisms of this domination, they include, of course, um, Air travel, as represented in this graph here, uh, from the large urban centers, and shipping on a very large scale, movement of materials around the planet, from enormous uh, container ports like this one of New, York, New Jersey and, and New York, uh, equally the one in Singapore is very large, just down the road from here. And all of this activity is having a dramatic effect on both local and global environments. This is um, air quality, uh, which is a major issue now, as many of you will know, in China, and this is in, in Beijing. All of this activity is also having very significant effects on global temperatures. This is from the latest um, IPCC report, drawing on an OAA paper, which is the United States, um, National Ocean and Traffic, and atmospheric data center. And you can clearly see there are really significant changes in temperature. Uh, record warmest temperatures, January to March, and we can play out the uh, On the western coast of the US, where they're currently got wildfires, right in the heart of the Atlantic, um, going down to South America, of course, into the southern Indian Ocean, uh, into uh, east of Borneo, as you can see there, and east of Australia, um, and up into the Arctic. So the data of the Arctic is showing you. That's actually the hottest area of all. And so ice melt is seen very rapidly in the Arctic at this time. Now all of these changes in ocean and atmospheric and land temperatures are having very significant effects on the weather. But these effects are often hidden and they're not referred to in the world news. So you're all familiar with conflict in the Middle East. Daily we see uh, headlines about people dying in Middle Eastern countries. Uh, what we don't see is the geophysical evidence, which seems quite clearly indicated that that region becomes more and more troubled as temperatures have risen and rainfall has declined. There's been a really significant decline in rainfall in the Mediterranean region uh, since about 1970. It's reached a crisis in 2007-8 when food prices spiked right across North Africa and the Mediterranean region. And then you have what was initially called the Arab Spring, which actually turned into something much darker, and then the outbreak of civil war in Syria, which is marked in red. And as you can see, it's the worst single affected area. That country has seen more uh, temperature rise and decline than any other country in, South in, in, in the Mediterranean region. It's no coincidence, then, that, that country is also a country experiencing very terrible civil war. Basically, Syria used to be the great past of the Middle East, and now it's having difficulty filling up food. The civil war broke out, the war against the government, which is now basically a fracture of the country. The terrible and tragic human consequences. We see these sort of things on our TV screen, so, but we do not see the geophysical links between war and what we're doing to the planet. But the science actually does reveal. Of course, we then have in Europe a massive um, migration crisis. Many, many refugees in Afghanistan, Israel, uh, in Syria, and Eritrea, all the regions uh, suffering serious civil disturbance, violence, and conflict. Um, not only there are, are we saying human effects, we are seeing very dramatic effects in the Earth system itself. Not, not, not least in the climate here, which is the, the, the three areas of long standing frozen ice in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, and in the Himalayan region. The Himalayan region is not the fastest, but the Arctic is not in the region. The ice core record there is a very reliable record which past the temperature change and is extremely useful for trying to work out what they're doing differently now and what happened in the past. 
and you've clearly seen from this high school record how far away from historic trends over the last you know, million years. Um, a few innovations of CO2 and methane are taking the atmosphere. And the uh, likely consequences of this uh, for the future of the planet are dramatic indeed. And what this is doing is leading to a significant change. Both scientists argue that we, we are in a new epoch because the Holocene is effectively being brought to an end. As you can see this in this more detailed graph, the Holocene was a period of roughly 8,000 years when the climate went through a remarkably stable period, a period unprecedented in the history of the human species and previously. We've been around for maybe 150, possibly maximum 200,000 years, and in that time, humans have migrated uh, following the oceans, rises and falls, constant changes in temperature, constant freezing and unfreezing of, of the ocean. But in the last 10,000 years, we've seen enduring civilizations, we've seen enduring um, marks of civilization on the planet, like the great seafarers that I visited last week in Sri Lanka, which have survived in thousands of years, similar to the pyramids, and indeed even our great religions, our, our sacred books have been passed down in the last 2,600 2, years, precisely because of climate stability. Because it's allowed for continuity of settlement, such as the earth is not made before. This is what we are putting in place. This is what we are going to do in this period of uh, the Anthropocene. Now, the, the distinctive thing about the Anthropocene is that it is the first time the human species has interacted and influenced the earth system as a whole, rather than just small regional parts of the earth system. The term Earth system refers to Earth's geophysical, chemical, and biological processes. It consists of the land, oceans, temperature, atmosphere, and poles, includes the planet's natural cycles and Earth's processes. In the Anthropocene, the Earth system now includes influences from human society. Social and economic systems are embedded in the Earth system, and in many cases are now the principal drivers of Earth system change. This is why we talk about the Anthropocene. The person who first coined the term Earth system is also the man who invented the whole idea of the logical time. And this is the man called James Adam, who happens also to be uh, a resident of the 20th century, along with James Watt. And indeed, they were both members of the uh, Society of Energy. He wrote a book called The Theory of the Earth in the 18th century, where he argued that the Earth was essentially a living sphere. And he found evidence for this in geological unconformity, such as this one on the east coast of Scotland, where you see two different types of rock. Old Precambrian rock uh, underneath, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, on top, and another layer of rock underneath, which completely has pushed up the uh, old rock, uh, forming a famous or uh, a key section in the geology. Now he looked at sites like this and he decided that the only explanation was that the Earth was essentially formed by subterranean activity. We're now very familiar with this. This is a completely new idea in the ocean. But of course, these significant changes in rock formations and unconformities meant that the Earth must be very, very, very old. Whereas until Hutton, People have thought that the world is only a few thousand years old, largely following their record given in the genealogy of the Bible and the other religious books of the Abraham traditions. Hassan, on the other hand, said, we see no message at the beginning, no prospect on it. Effectively, James Hassan invented theological, or what sometimes we now call deep time. Now, what to me is very interesting as a theologian in all of this is that natural sciences. When they think about geological epochs and eras, like the Holocene and the Atlas, measure the beginning and the end of these eras in terms of geomorphic events, such as the tilt of the earth towards the sun, the famous melancholy tilt, uh, or plate tectonics, or atmospheric gas proportions. But in religious history, the gods and human ancestors are the principal change agents in our system. This is, of course, Michelangelo's famous painting of the exile of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden uh, on the roof of the Sistine Chapel. And in this, in this religious history, 
human activity as a main uh, source of the periodization of world history. And this remains true in the other Abrahamic faiths, including Islam. So then, until the invention of deep time, humans universally thought of time and history in intergenerational human terms. And they thought that the world was much more than 6,000 years old. But this intergenerational history was based on biblical genealogies from Adam to Christ, and you've got similar genealogies in the Quranic uh, traditions and the Hadith. It's perhaps not surprising then that the first to announce the new age of humans. The ones who are most sensitive to the book, to the were not actually natural scientists, but theologians who in the 19th century argued that we seem to be transiting into a new era because of human actions. Not because of theological events, but because of human actions. So it was, it's, to me as a theologian, it's very interesting that the first people who argued that we were moving into a new epoch, because what we were doing to the earth, because of the coming of the Christ, the non-natural scientist that came out in the United States. One of them was a man called Antonio Stefani, a very famous Italian theologist, who had also been a Roman Catholic priest, but got chucked out of the church because uh, of his scientific teachings, which they didn't think were orthodox. And he argued that effectively human beings in the 19th century were at the beginning of a new era, because of the extent of man's footprint on the earth. And there's an Indian that human beings increasingly were taking over the earth. I'm not going to read every word, and, uh, and I'll leave the slide behind for those who want to follow them up. And he called this era the Anthropocenic era, an era essentially shaped by the, the Anthropozoan, the, the human species, uh, rather than other uh, events. And he says it had already begun in the 19th century, and geologists and on predictions end. And he went on, nothing makes us suspect that Adam and Stephen might be close to extinct for a or humanity is too young if compared to that idea of a primitive civilization of which mankind's first born can't conceive. But as contained as a number of centuries, God is willing to conceive the triumph of the intelligence of God may be, the earth will not now escape the hands of man. The first trace of man marks the beginning of the end. But the, the second uh, person to think along these lines was a man called Tyler Shannon. He was very prominent in the science and uh, religion, um, literature, and I know that the science and technology studies are similarly to Mohani, that essentially human beings were so influential now in the shape of the planet that they were changing the nature of uh, human of, of evolution. And rather than naming a new epoch, he named uh, a new uh, way of thinking about the earth, where mind, the human mind, and physical matter come together into something that we call the narrow sphere. The third person I'm going to mention is a man called Tom Day. He was also a, a used to call himself a geo-lodger rather than a theater. So he was very much you know, a figure in uh, his family in the United States on the theory of science and religion. And he argued we are moving into not the Anthropocene, but the Ecozoic uh, era, in which he said human beings are increasingly discovering that the universe is a communion of subjects and not a collection of objects. However, he warned, we are in our industrial civilization have become autistic. We no longer listen to what the earth, its landscape, its atmospheric phenomena, etc., are telling us. Cosmologically oriented vision, he said, is the way to the future. We need to recognize the story of the universe. We know it from our empirical sciences as our sacred story. From its beginning, the universe has had a physical, psychic, spiritual, as well as a physical, material dimension. And these words, he's very close to the wonderful Islamic thinker, who I know was uh, Professor Adesan. Baruan's um, uh, supervisor, I think it was, uh, Slay was saying that's your own. I could have quoted him as well, but uh, the time didn't clear that. So then, from my perspective as a theologian, the cultural adoption of the discourse of the Anthropocene by scientists in the late 20th century and the early 21st century, in important ways, recovers the way that we theologians have long thought about time. 
which is the images that we think of time as oriented around the actions and the events of dogs and humans and their interaction together. However, the connected media of the generations in the Anthropocene is not the succession of saints in religious history, but the dark clouds associated with the industrial pollution since the 19th century. And another person uh, who I am very fond of who uh, also observed that these dark clouds were ushering a new and troubling era in human history is a man called John Buskin was perhaps most famous in Britain for having been one of those who helped establish the late history as a place of great uh, romantic attachment and uh, ultimately our first national park in uh, the United Kingdom, our first common environment. Um, he wrote a very interesting essay in the 19th century called Storm Cloud in the 19th century. He studied clouds, and I like to study clouds too. Clouds are very interesting. And sometimes you see clouds with this completely unpleasant. And in this year, we're seeing more and more clouds in Mexico, which are very strange. And almost certainly, because of the extent to which we are now intervening in the um, atmosphere, not least because of the increased amount of water vapor that is now in the atmosphere as a result of um, rising land and sea temperature. So he saw an extraordinary phenomenon in the skies of the Lake District, and he blamed it very dark clouds, sultry foul fog. Um, and it's some of you might say it just sounds like English weather. Um, but he thought it was something new. And he blamed what he called Manchester's devil darkness. In other words, the industrial emissions from the chimneys of the first great city of the Industrial Revolution. And he argued that his great concern was that the landscapes and the seascapes and the skyscapes painted by romantic painters like J.W. E. Turner and this wonderful. Uh, famous painting would no longer be available to people in the rest because the sky would be dark and dense and the world would be changed forever. And it wouldn't be possible for children, our children and grandchildren to see the world as we see it. And he was very troubled by this. And he said that the signs of the sky ought to be taken as signs of the times. It would be a phrase used very often in religious uh, language to speak about signs of the times being. Uh, we should wake up, we should change. And he said, whether you can bring the sun back or not, you can surely bring back your cheerfulness and your honesty. You may not be able to say to the witness, peace be still, which is uh, a reference to the story of Christ setting the storm, and this is Rembrandt's famous painting of that event. But you can see from the insolence of your own lips and the troubling of your own passion. And all that it would be extremely well to do, even though the day were coming when the sun should be as dark. And he goes on, the paths of rectitude and piety once regained, who shall say the promise of old time would not be found to hold for us also? Bring me all the tithes, or in, in Islamic language, Zaka, into my storehouse. And prove me now herewith, says the Lord, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out the blessing, and that shall not be room enough to receive it. Ruskin said, look at the signs of the times and repent change your ways, including your economics, if you are going to turn the ship around. Well, the language of the Anthropocene in natural science works rather differently. And perhaps the most famous uh, scientific uh, graph in the last few years, addressing the issue of the ecological limits uh, to human activity in the Anthropocene, is this from a paper by Rockstock, Sterling, and others, called a safe operating space for humanity. And in this graph they argue that uh, we need to conceive of the different ways that we need to be in the Earth system. Uh, and this graph has wedges. And the safe operating space is in the green, the inner green core. And on that measure they argue uh, on climate change, on biodiversity, and the third one is um, nitrogen cycle We've already far exceeded the safe operating space. And we definitely need to bring these back into uh, the planetary limits. Difficulty, however, is it, it's one thing to clean up the air of one city, which is what we did in London after the great smog of the late 1950s, where so many people died. Um, with a clean air act, we're clean, you go to London and you don't see these spots, and you can see the blue sky, unlike in Beijing. 
Um, it's another thing to clean up this. It's another thing to clean up the skies of the earth. They don't belong to only one city. And this raises a fundamental question in the nature of the organization of uh, the world in the 21st century. First raised by the, um, a jurist in Germany, uh, this is called the Second World War, called Carl Smith, who said the acute question poses upon whom will fall the frightening power implied in the world embracing economic and technological organization. This question can't be dismissed simply, everything will function automatically, things will just administer themselves. Under the government, by people, over people will be superfluous because humans will be free. Or well, what would they be free? This can be answered by optimistic or pessimistic conjectures, all of which finally means grand sorts of depression and death. In this respect, again, the global infiltration of our global technological sophisticated market economy on the earth and the dangers it poses to human life and life on earth raises the question who are we? What is it to be a human being? What are we here for? Now, for Crickson, the Anthropocene is basically a question of governance. He says we need a new kind of global governmentality where we have a worldwide strategy to uh, sustain ecosystems, reduce human stresses on them. And this, he suggests, will come about through vastly improved technology and management. Better management of the Earth's resources, control of human and animal populations, and careful manipulation and restoration of the environment. Humankind is bound to remain a noticeable theological force, he says, as long as it is removed by disease and force or serious destruction, which is so generously provided by many But the earlier theological proponents of a new epoch, such as the ones I have mentioned, the model of a new age of humans isn't only a bigger and more powerful global government uh, or system management. Perhaps instead, the very we need to be more humble, and we need to awaken our senses to the fact that we are living on a planet with other beings who increasingly have become less sensitive to people. We need to find a way then to reconnect our human systems with the interconnected ecosystem of the Earth. John Ruskin argued even more radically that the real problem is the lawless modern economy. This is the reason the air in cities is being wrecked. And he argued for an end to debt based, profit oriented capitalism. In the famous economic critique of capitalism called Unto This Last. And he said that de debt based capitalism was opposed to the British principles in the Abrahamic states on usury, debt, and wealth accumulation and greed. Uh, without the strength. I think Rusty was very, very dramatic in saying these things to the madness. The climate crisis and the growing crisis of extinction then are occurring at a time of unique collective integration of human action and the global economy. For the first time in history, economic actions by large corporations and myriad individuals are joined together by technological systems and they are affecting not only local regions but the earth system itself and its chemical and geological processes. However, collective, ethical, political deliberation of actions, intentions, and outcomes requires communities to exist in particular places where they can reach agreement about how to share resources. That is what a nation is, and that is what politics is. The difficulty that we face is that we increasingly interconnect economic form of organization that now, in a sense, runs the Earth system, isn't easily subjected to the old kind of law and politics, because it keeps spilling out from national boundaries. And this is made even worse by the fact that the nations that lay the great Cyrus, the United Kingdom, the United States in particular, have since 1970 embraced an economic ideology and neoliberalism, which is anti-political. Ferdinand Hayek and Milton Friedman famously argued that individuals and corporations realize their welfare maximally when they are free to act independently of ethical, political, or legal restraints. So in the US, the UK, and increasingly in national governments right around the world, it appears, including here in Asia, you have politicians and governments refusing the state 
cities or local communities ought seriously to be able to regulate the activities of corporations and uh, the magic of the market. Such people are pursuing instead a false utopian dream of free trade for corporations that undermines the ability of local communities, cities, national parliaments, or even the law courts to restrain and regulate economic activities. We even will need to destroy habitats, ecosystems, or threaten the earth system itself. Again, I think Carl Smith was incredibly impressive when he said, Today is nothing more modern than the onslaught against the political. Whether it's American finances, industrial technologies, or whatever, they all unite in demanding that the biased rule of politics over economic management be done away with. There must, on this account, be no longer political problems, only organizational, technical, and economic to the social class. The kind of economic thinking that prevails today is no longer capable of perceiving a political idea. Long mistakes seem to have become what Max Weber predicted, a human industrial design. Anyone seen this film? Hands up. Just to make sure it's all listening. Yeah, good film, then. Eh? For me, one of the highlights of the film is the moment when the star of the, of the film, played by Sandy Bullock, finally gets back to work. And she gets out of this little bubble that she'd been in that rescued her from the disaster that happened in space, and she's in water. Even then, she, she's not home. She's underwater. She has to swim up on the surface to breathe there, and then she has to get to land. And when she gets to land, she puts her fingers and her fingernails in the soil on the edge of the sea. Finally, she's back home on Mother Earth. That's the only place where she is safe. She was not safe in space. There is no other Earth. There's no other planet we can live on. There's no safety in space. It's a brilliant film and uh, really worth watching if you haven't seen it. We are earthbound creatures. We are earthlings. But the novel, the reality of the global market economy, make less the nations and the economy are earthbound. The result is that the negative costs of capital accumulation and greed spill over into other nations. Whether it's climate changing, uh, temperatures in Syria, or closing the home here in Bangladesh, which is increasingly over a month of its surface being rendered uninhabitable by flooding from the Himalaya and by rising and strengthening storms in the Bay of Bengal. Hence, many Bangladeshi refugees. And indeed, I encounter a number of Bangladeshi past many quarrels the last few weeks. The conventional interpretation of such Cross border harms. In the tradition of ethics, which I belong, the tradition of tradition, is that language of just war. A language that has much influenced international uh, war, the law of war over the last 200 years. Is interference in the climate by large fossil fuel companies and so on a just cause, a justice cause for war? Well, I'm sure we, want, we wouldn't want to use the language of war. And yet, how else to think of it? If if a significant number of nations, let's say Canada and the US and Russia, refuse to change their massive over extraction of fossil fuels in the future, they are effectively destroying the habitability of countries like Syria and Bangladesh. In the old days, that means they were at war. They are at war with Syria and Bangladesh. How else to repair such cross border damages? But well, one way might be legal and economic reparation. But what court in the world is going to enforce what's happening, the cost to what's happening in Syria or Bangladesh against the United States of America, a country which refuses that it belongs to a world court, or for that matter, uh, Russia under Putin? And then what about future generations? Could they sue the present generation? Or will they be around to be sued? We've had the pleasure, they will take the pain. The philosopher Hans Jonas argued that there's no precedent in human history for the degree of influence humans have acquired over the planet. And as a consequence, he said, of increased scientific and technological powers, but the problem is our ethics lags far behind the human power. For Jonas, and indeed I've argued the same way in work, the root of the problem is the divide between psyche and business, between 
mind and matter, nature and culture. Overcoming this divide then is central to the ethical as well as the technical of the Christ. The difficult is that our cultural patterns, the cultural patterns associated with the Great Acceleration, are leading us to an ever greater dissociation between daily life and consciousness and ecosystems, elements, and species. People forget water comes from forests. Kuala Lumpur is rather forgotten, it seems to me, in recent times. Still hacking away at the water catchment of the city while the development of Kuala Lumpur is literally stalled because there's no longer enough reliable water reserves to, fund, uh, to, 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 to put water into the new buildings people still want to construct here. Okay, there's now a pipeline from Bahang, and it seems with the previous line of state government, it might finally be joined up to the federal territory. But the point is, if we looked after the water catchment area better, we wouldn't need that pipeline. If we thought a bit more carefully about what's going on in the hills and what the hills are doing for the city, if we just look at the horizon of the shopping mall, the horizon of the skyscraper, we don't look to the hills from whence coming our aid, as the psalmist says. Nations are rather like this too. They are earthbound entities. They exist within borders. But in a global economy, you have a growing possible movement of goods and people, and this becomes the new norm. Here I am today, and I'm in Scotland on Friday. Nations increasingly use the powers of the state, though, in this context, not to protect the heritage and the Commonwealth within their borders, but to advance the profits and trading prospects of internationally mobile businesses, capital, and elites. The national interest is therefore no longer aligned with protection against environmental, uh, in border, or cross border harms. This is superbly and tragically illustrated in the Malaysian case of what's going on in Sumatra and elsewhere in Southeast Asia's forests. This was Malacca a couple of years back when I was um, staying with a friend of mine. We were just at the top of uh, Christchurch, the pink church in the square there. But most of the city was obscured by an enormous fire from Sumatra in 2013. And this was a satellite picture of the event that I was caught up in. Mind. One day I went to bed and you could see the sky the next day I woke up and it smelled, literally smelled like a bonfire, a whole town. Quite extraordinary. This uh, is the hotspots from fires in this region from a data graph of the Singapore government, uh, which was a uh, snapshot of, of the scene in July uh, 25th. Well, I think mean, it was a friend in Penang, we saw by the case. And look at the hotspots, the worst of them in Ria, the province of Ria, which is an enormous people, contains vast quantities of greenhouse gases, but who are the companies in that? They're doing the burning. One of the reasons the Malaysian government doesn't make much fuss about this is because the Malaysian government knows jolly well who is doing the burning. Because the Malaysian government itself has got property shares in the companies that are doing the burning in Sumatra. Sumatra is the only colony of West Malaysia for this purpose. That's the plant in oil. Singapore makes lots of noise about it, of course, but then it turns out most of the Indonesian companies involved uh, in the burning are themselves registered on the Singapore Stock Exchange because they're trying to evade Indonesian regulations and Indonesian government taxes. So I think Singapore also is going to be strong. The point is that neither country is really attending to the welfare of its own citizens by burning the forest in this region. Let alone the welfare of people living in Sumatra or in Thailand. Even if these two countries just attended more to the health interests of people living here now, they will be good, they will do more about the climate. But they don't. They allow the burning to carry on every year. You all know this like the this is Asia in summer. It's not a good These fires could be stopped. And actually it's mainly Malaysians who can stop them. Because it's mainly Malaysians who ultimately are making money from starting. And of course these are the scene. And this is the end point. The end point, as you well know, is to turn virgin forests, people releasing all the CO2 and methane into the atmosphere and turn it into a casino. Uh, name is yeah. The climate crisis is global in its extent. It is a crisis of a new epoch, the Anthropocene, which represents Earth system interference by one species on a collective scale. Some say, it's, it, uh, it is therefore, climate change in particular, a uniquely wicked collective action problem. The 
because all human beings interact with the carbon cycle. When we breathe oxygen, we breathe out CO2. So maybe we should all stop breathing and then we would have some of the Well, I don't entirely accept this analysis. The climate crisis is unique in another way. And it is, this is in the extent to which national governments now betray what I as a theologian would call their sacred duty as guardians of the sacred terrestrial heritage of their own people. Malaysia, the United Kingdom, the US, EU, our, our governments forced to be invested in preserving the water catchments, the soils, the forests, and the air quality of their own lands and their own people for the present and future generations. And if they did that, they would also be addressing climate change. Because if we had less lightning and less pollution from, from airplanes and all the rest of it, less burning of forests, uh, not only would air quality improve, and people don't want to here in Malaysia, but Malaysia's uh, contribution to the CO2 emissions was significantly declined. So it's not just a problem of the future. It's not just a collective action problem. It is a few of the many governments around the world now to act in the common interest and the health interests of their own people. They're acting instead, as they all do, in the interest of maximizing shareholder value or corporations headquartered in their countries or in other countries. I'm nearly at an end. Or the class name, is the Citigroup La Date C, care for our common health. Both France has issued an unprecedented chunk of the root causes for the international crisis. It's unprecedented that, that is by world leaders. The France says the root causes are quite clear economic growth without limits, personal, individual greed, the destruction of the environment and livelihoods of poor and indigenous people. This region is the indigenous people who suffer most from the forest alone. Blind following of what Francis calls the magic of markets and technological power. Francis, in particular, and you've got a lot of stick from the American economists saying this, but I'm particularly with him on this, projects the use of carbon emissions markets to resolve climate change. And they clearly do not work. These markets have absolutely no impact whatsoever on greenhouse gas emissions. They've raised vast amounts of funds, they've created all kinds of stupid and ridiculous games for. People to play with carbon emissions, but they don't make any difference to what's going on. In the the paper argues instead that the technologies of the industrial economy uh, need to be realigned with the ecosystems and the natural laws of the planet. As he puts it, there's no waste of nature, but at the core of the culture of capitalism, which is wrecking our world, is a throwaway culture. It wastes in ways nature cannot be known. Now, modern science and technology have revealed deep truths about the processes which gave rise to life on Earth. In so doing, they have advanced human longevity, comfort, and wealth beyond the dreams of our forebears. But they have also fostered a culture which treats matter on the Earth as merely matter available for human reorder. Science and economics fail to recognize that there is an infinite order in the Earth that ought to be respected, in which in the religious traditions, we call since is an interlining matter by a divine creator. Sometimes we call this mindfulness. Mindfulness emerged at a relatively early stage in the evolution of life on Earth, as is evidenced by a series of succession turns that life took, and which led to the evolution of mammalian and human life. This convergence of evolution of a number of uh, key things, such as uh, ball and socket joints, such as retinas, which made human life possible. These, these things were evolution, life investment many, many times before humans finally evolved. To me and others, this shows that there has been a process of work in the history of life and in biology and in chemistry, which is something like mindfulness, which is directed right towards the creation of the most mindful conscious beings, uh, which are human beings. Now, the spontaneity of life in evolving ecosystems, however, finds a perverse simulacrum. I'm sorry for the complicated thing, but sort of a perverse analogy. The supposedly spontaneous, self organizing systems of global economic markets and trading exchanges. This artificial spontaneity, so admired by neoliberals, lacks the deep, spirit inspired mindfulness manifested in the apparently spontaneous evolution of life on Earth. 
The language of the Anthropocene, then, in some art, points to the fact that contemporary humanity stands at the door of a new age, sometimes called the age of humans. But as with the entry into the original age of humans, the exile from paradise of Adam and Eve, this new time presents us with a deep one for choice about what it is to be human. As individuals precious in the eye of God, we are made, as the topic seems to be upon him said, uh, for loving us and compassion towards each other. We have uniquely sacred capacities in the evolutionary order, both in the Islamic and Christian traditions, we believe this, to choose to love others above ourselves, and to direct our energy to the relief of the suffering of others, including the protection of the weak and defenseless creatures of the earth. In Asia, the first waves of climate migrants are already taking the best and trying to get across land borders, not least from Bangladesh and Myanmar. 60% of the residents of that nation of Bangladesh are threatened, according to scientists, in the next 30 years with eviction by flood and storm from their overcrowded terrestrial home. Because of the extent of melting ice in the Himalayas, Seasonally flooding vast areas of the country now, and by rising seas and strong storms in the Bay of Bengal. In the Christian tradition, the definitive parable about ethical choice and what it is to be human is the parable of the Samaritan. This is Grand Grand Saint's choice, many things of this parable, where the, um, the Good Samaritan is giving some money to the innkeeper, taking the guy off his horse. Uh, and ask the main people to look after him. In the story, a priest and a theologian, and I am both, so it's obviously aimed at me, uh, walk along the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, they pass someone who has been attacked by thieves and left for dead, and they ignore him and walk along on the other side of the road. And it follows a foreigner, a Samaritan, someone who is not a Jew, an enemy of the Samaritan Jew. The time of Christ, and turns aside from his journey to give care and love to the one in need. This story in the Christian tradition defines the core concept of ethics to choose to love another who is not known to you, to choose to act in ways which reduce the suffering of others who are not known to us, whether people in Bangladesh, in Syria, or people in future generations, our first and sacred moral duty in a time, an epoch, when we have become the most influential force on this planet, a geological force, is to find ways to reduce our impact on the environment in our daily lives, and at the same time, find ways to ameliorate the suffering of those around the world whom the multiple crisis is putting in harm's way. Thank you very much for this. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very happy. I'm a university lecturer, so what I normally do is at this point is that we have a quick break, and I suggest that you talk to the person next to you rather than the audience, and see if we can come up with something to ask me. Okay, that's a much better plan, I think. So you've got three minutes, okay? Uh, and uh, see if you can come up Or something you disagree with, you know, or something you didn't understand. So just talk. How did you get on anybody got a burning question they'd like to Yeah. This is part of the, the issue of we need to know who we are. 
question what our responsibilities are. And uh, we also have an amana, a, a trust, a responsibility to, be a, to look after, to uh, be a good steward. Um, so this will be an exciting perspective uh, from the beginning. And uh, mm -hmm. I think this is what's cycle. Uh, in, in the, because uh, uh, unfortunately we must endorse also foreign um, you know, the West in, in, uh, in all of these things. Um, but um, uh, it's also uh, interesting that the, uh, the, the problems in the earth, the corruption that we see on the earth, are also reflecting the inner state of man. Um, that, uh, you know, we, we have become like, uh, we, we think we're all powerful and we're trying to dominate everything. Whereas, as you said, you know, we need to be humble. Um, and, and this is the approach. And we need to respect, you know, our uh, fellow creations, you know. Um, that we're all together, you know, uh, creation of ours, you know, uh, driving from the earth itself, uh, living earth. Um, so, um, also we have the concept of uh, beneficial knowledge and non-beneficial knowledge. Um, that uh, there's, there's no point in seeking after non-beneficial knowledge. And the same applies to technologies. Um, that some technologies are just, you know, um, are very harmful to humanity, such as the atomic bomb. Um, and there are many other cases um, that one can cite. So, uh, with any new like innovation or invention, uh, there needs to be a system whereby we can evaluate uh, this technology, whether it's going to be beneficial for humanity. So, uh, it's been suggested that um, uh, the application of Newcastle Sharia, uh, for instance, in, higher objectives of atomic law, uh, which have been spelt out, and uh, that uh, this could be applied as some sort of uh, evaluation tool for the new technology, uh, that it must pass that test first before it's sort of promoted to the benefit of mankind. Uh, so I, I think those would be my really comments, you know, because I think that this one has a lot to say about the uh, solution to the issues that we've raised. Sorry, thank you very much. Certainly the concept of both sharing is shared between all the other hundred traditions. So the idea that we can put on a to guard the earth, this goes right. Of course it's in the book of the first uh, the book of Genesis chapter one, verse twenty-eight. And, and this idea of vice region, vice sharing still has deeply informed the Christian um uh, Muslim traditions for two thousand years ago. But as you've rightly say, both Muslims and Christians are trying to forget this feature in recent times and going after profit and, um, and greed and uh, adopting that for their sacred duty. So I think there'll be more. Thank you very much for the very important points. I think I'll do more, but yeah, I don't know. I was going to point out the economic uh, elements that are associated with the economic elements that are associated well, there, have, there, there is a whole uh, movement now called um, heterodox economics. Um, there's another society of uh, environmental economists. So there's a growing diversification in the uh, ways to engage economics and um, the environmental crisis. Uh, however, the mainstream economics profession are incredibly resistant to thinking of the human economy as earth bound. And um, at the same time, um, Investors and rich people don't like the idea of being earthbound either. That's why so many um, uh, rich people now seek to set up companies in places like the British Virgin Islands and Grand Cayman and uh, elsewhere, where they can sort away the profits of their old cotton gates uh, from the uh, all saying eyes of the public, the golf course. Um, so whether it's um, the greed of investors or the misleading models of economists, I'm afraid. The economic profession has got a lot to answer for, in my view, in terms of the degree to which we don't think of ourselves as earthbound creatures anymore. We have in the last 50 years mobilized economically the, the output of the three banks, not one. And economics has to change as a discipline, has to get more uh, scientifically aware as a discipline, uh, if we're going to get out of our whole relation. Um, but I do see signs of that. In the UK, we've had um, students themselves protesting uh, at the economic discipline and the textbooks that they have. We say, so I'm sure it's the idea of misleading. 
and they need to be trained to affect how they manage it. So, um, if there are any students here, then you can have a role to play as well as the professors. Right. Thank you. Thank you. It's very hard to develop these spiritual and ethical practices to resist the power of the image. Um, Islam has a very interesting thing to say about images and idols and the power of the image to mislead. This is why in Islam, as you all know, uh, it's not permitted to uh, make images of persons, including of the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, and put them in mosques or in Quranic texts. Um, but um, in that sense, the modern world, in its devotion to the image and the idol, is directly contrary to uh, core Islamic teaching. What I find odd is that Islamic countries are unbelievers in uh, driving consumers. You know, I'm flying back to Abu Dhabi and uh, just look at that, that place. You, know, you look at the bar, you know. And they're building all these temples for consumers in the bar, you know, even bigger than what we build in London. So it doesn't seem to me that in practice this description of images in this application is having much effect on the spread of consumers in the first century. Any more than the description of Protestant Christians in, uh, in, in Europe has had much effect on the spread of images in Europe and their power. But we do need to recognize the individuals in the hierarchy and uh, the wrong images can be focused on the very bad way. So, um, is that a question that is a spiritual one? Well, as well as a spiritual one, we need to change our ways. Um, on the other side of things, for me, uh, it's very important to replace the bad images with good ones, the bad experiences with good ones. So, whenever I travel, I try, and wherever I am at home, I try to spend time out of doors. I try to spend time in the nature. I try to find evil things that God has made rather than we have made. Because these make me happier, they reconnect me with the universe and the source of life, and they reconnect me with nature, and hopefully also add to the ways to restrain my seeking for pleasure and satisfaction in the CMR objects rather than the things that God has made. Uh, so when I'm in the office, I always try to stay in an area where I know that I can go jogging out of the place I'm staying in the morning into some into the uh I'm classic the lake gardens. Because if I spend an hour in there in the mornings, I come away full of gratitude at the beauty of that place and the much of God who created it. So in my own life, I very much tend to do that. That also speaks to me about the importance of environmental education and putting young people on campuses and in school into situations where they can kind of experience a nature at first hand. We may be living in a more and more interconnected world, but the connection between that world and the real physical world, these are the ones that increasingly we're going to see. So we have to educate our children and grandchildren to rediscover those connections, according to God given as they are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, this is a lot of going on in technology sites for over a hundred years. 
uh, I teach amongst other things technology studies and intro and like teacher course on technology and ethics and religion. I would disagree with the statement that technology is automatically good or bad. Um, I see very little good that came out of splitting up the atoms in my hand. I see a great deal of bad. Um, the motor car, when it was invented, the Victorians thought it was such a dangerous thing that they insisted that every motor car would have a man in front of it with a red flag. To warn people on the road that it was coming, so they didn't kill anybody. <laughs> well, then, as you know, it's not a bad idea because nobody got killed in those days by most cars. Now, of course, it's the single largest cause of death to uh, adults in sub Saharan Africa. It's the single largest cause of death to rich young people in the United Kingdom. It's probably one of the largest causes of death to young adults here in Malaysia. And the driving habits I've been saying for a while, I've been So, I don't agree that technologies are. Neither good nor bad. Uh, the motor car, I think, is the most prominent idol of our time. And I don't see a lot of good in it. I'm sorry to say. Uh, I have a, I do currently present it. I try to use it as little as possible, and I don't use it in the city. I get on a bicycle. The bicycle for me is an intrinsically good technology. The motor car, on the other hand, for the most part, I think is an intrinsically bad thing. Well, I could say more. It's a very intrinsic problem. I, I don't take the view that some take that technologies are merely means to ends. They are technologies to direct us. <coughs> Jet engines and motor cars direct us to speed, and speed is not an intrinsic good. If those people on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho had slowed down a bit, they might have shown compassion to the people. If you speed past 70 miles an hour in action on a motorway, then you're not taking care. Of the people on the motorway. Any other thoughts? Yeah. So I took it up. Very good. Oh, yeah, sorry. In the front. Yeah. So, do you see that the United Nations is going to have this new sustainable development goal soon, right? In September. So, what do you think that whether this will be another. another policy, or it will help in revitalizing the spiritual in humans, towards protecting the earth, or? Well, um, <coughs> the, the United Nations is not the most uh, globally effective uh, body, as many of us know. Currently, the United States government, the European Commission, uh, and a number of governments here in Asia are pursuing global treaties to liberate trade, from the remaining laws and regulations that national parliaments have over the years tried to impose upon global corporations to prevent them wrecking the planet. And yet the, the United Nations stands by and watches these trade negotiations, all of which are designed to destroy local law, to destroy the power of the national courts, and to destroy the power of parliaments to regulate capitalism. So if the UN was really a serious body of world governments, it would immediately stand up and say, the Transatlantic Trade Treaty and the Trans Pacific Trade Treaty are contrary to the Commonwealth and the common good of this planet and to the good of peoples and lawful government of human affairs and should be stopped in their tracks. But the UN does not do this. So I'm sorry to say I'm not a particularly strong believer in the power of the UN to have it shipped around. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a pessimist. I, I think people can change. I think we will change in the end. Uh, as a lecture a few years ago where I heard somebody say, well, the thing is that eventually the rich will get it, that um, climate change threatens their wealth. Uh, I mean, that's a particularly pessimistic way of putting it. But I honestly think that citizens can change. We've done it in the past, we will do it in the future. I remain hopeful as a human being. I remain hopeful that we can change our lives. We can improve our relationships with nature with other species. I'm reminded of that saying of the prophet who said uh, recently upon him that even if it were to be the end of the world tomorrow, if you plant a tree, then you do a righteous thing. I thank you, God, well, to avoid. Uh, and I continue to believe in that. I continue to dig my garden and plant my vegetables every year, however bad the weather gets, before all that melting ice in the North Atlantic. I'll carry on digging. I'll carry on trying to grow some food. Because that's our call to care and to guard other life. That's what we're here for. Uh, we don't stop doing that. And we don't stop. We don't lose hope in that. Just because there are some wicked people around who seem to be scaring things in a different direction right now. 
Thank you very much.